Okay, this is about um, iron and cancer. So this picture here is, first of all, it's, two, it's really two separate pictures. There's a picture of an egg. Okay, an egg has a permeable shell whereby there's some gas exchange across the shell and bacteria could get in through the shell, but they don't injure the egg. So why is it that a bacteria could get into the shell but doesn't get to the yolk where the embryo is of the egg, the baby chicken? Okay, the reason is the egg white, which is just the protein around it, has no iron in it. So in order to grow, a bacteria needs iron to proliferate. So it needs that iron to grow and then eventually make its way towards the yolk. Because there's no iron in the egg white, the bacteria cannot survive and reach the egg yolk. And it's like a human walking in the desert. Okay, walking in the desert, there's the hot sun. Uh, a person can't go very far in the desert because there's no water. And the human body does the same thing in the sense that it deprives bacteria of iron to prevent them from proliferating in our body. And this becomes relevant. We're talking about cancer because cancer is really like an anaerobic bacteria. That's about one of the most important things you could ever know about cancer. It's like an anaerobic bacteria. Now, I know you probably heard all this stuff about genetic theory of cancer, and yeah, it's fine to know about genetic theory of cancer, but you really should know about the metabolic theory of cancer. The metabolic theory of cancer is much more useful. If you want to understand cancer, um, trust me, when you go down the path of understanding the metabolic theory of cancer, all kinds of helpful insights will occur to you. Whereas when you sit in the genetic path, you're like, what are you going to do? It's genetic. That's you don't want to go down that path. You want to understand metabolic theory of cancer. Okay. And by the way, you won't see the metabolic theory of cancer discussed in the typical medical student textbooks. You're going to have to go outside of that. I, I've given a bunch of lectures on it, and you can discover it once you're aware of it, the whole Varberg effect and everything. Okay, so now let's talk about iron in the context of cancer. Hepatitis B virus, common infection of the liver. And, you know, why does it cause cancer? One theory is that when you have inflammation, there's a big immune response and there's a lot of scar tissue and that can deprive some cells of oxygen. Most cells, when deprived of oxygen, depending on the severity, they'll just die. They go into programmed cell death when it's a gradual process and their internal components are recycled through lysosomes, for example. And then the immune system comes in with macrophages and just reabsorbs the molecules, sends them to other cells. All right, but also you'll have some cells that are not killed by the hypoxia from the inflammation. They're just de-energized, if you will. You need oxygen to make the most amounts of ATP. You can get like 36 ATP from each glucose when you've got oxygen present versus because you're using electron transport oxidative phosphorylation in the mitochondria. You can only make about, 18, about two ATPs uh, when you don't have oxygen present. So what I'm saying is some cells will transform into anaerobic cells, and that's called the Warburg effect in the setting of hypoxia. And they're basically becoming de-differentiated. They're becoming like an anaerobic bacteria. A fully mature cell in the human body, let's say in the liver, its job is to be part of the liver, and it needs tons of energy to do all the things that liver cells do. It has to make bile. It has to detoxify all kinds of chemicals. It has to maintain blood glucose levels. That's a lot of work. It takes a lot of energy. Whereas a cancer cell says, screw it. I'm not doing all that liver stuff. I'm just trying to survive and multiply. So it's behaving like an anaerobic bacteria. Okay, so first of all, uh, we're going to talk about that some more. But just realize that that's a real important point. Hypoxia transforms a cell into a primitive cell, de-differentiated, that behaves like an anaerobic bacteria. No longer does it care about functioning as a member of the group of the liver. It just wants to survive and proliferate. It is only out for itself. Um, it doesn't have enough energy to really function like a true liver cell anymore. Okay, Hepatitis B patients that are iron overloaded, they have a markedly increased risk of developing liver cancer. Okay, Baruch Bloomberg uh, is one of the Nobel Prize winners. He did some research on this, and there's plenty of other papers and topics about this. Uh, the liver is especially prone to iron overload-related problems like cirrhosis and liver cancer because the liver is a main, one of the main sites in the human body to store iron. Okay, in, in, in the setting, it puts it into ferritin as an intracellular storage molecule. 
Okay, here is just a picture of our guy again. Depriving a bacteria of iron prevents the bacteria from growing. Um, and in a human, if we can deprive cancer of iron, that leads to a better prognosis in many cases. Okay. Okay, what's other examples related to this as far as iron is concerned and diet? In Papua New Guinea, they smoked a lot of tobacco, but they ate like 93% of their calories from sweet potatoes. Relatively low incidence, comparatively speaking, of lung cancer. Japanese eating a rice diet with a lot of vegetables. Even though they smoked a lot and had a lot of sodium in their diet, not that bad of an incidence of lung cancer. Whereas the Americans who had the same habits in terms of smoking a lot, they would have a more significantly more lung cancer. And it's thought it was because they were eating a sad diet with a lot more um, dietary fat and also a lot more iron in it. Okay, so that's why they're, the diet was thought to be by some people just as important or more important even than the smoking. Uh, so those are two major contributors there, the high fat and the high iron amount you know, in the westernized diet with a lot of meat, a lot of red meat in particular. Okay, why does that happen? We talked about the high fat causing tissue ischemia, but also the meat um, and the excessive storage iron leading to what is thought to be more free iron leading to more oxidative stress, lipid peroxidation. And that lipid peroxidation of a mitochondrial membrane will damage the mitochondria. Mitochondrial damage leads to mitochondrial dysfunction, leads to increased risk of the cell either dying or being transformed into a primarily anaerobic bacteria-like cell. Okay, so we talked about a cancer cell being de-differentiated. Instead of being a fully differentiated mature member of the liver, it becomes a primitive anaerobic bacteria-like cell. Uh, bacteria need lots of iron to grow. Cancer needs lots of iron to grow. Cancer cells will have put out tons of transferrin receptors on their plasma membrane to try to grab iron, take iron in. They want, they want iron and they want glucose. So we talked about why does the egg yolk do it? No iron in the egg white to protect the yolk. Um, okay, men and women with higher iron levels have increased risk of cancer. Uh, breast cancer patients tend to have elevated ferritins. Okay, how can elevated iron levels contribute to cancer? It actually can contribute to each of the three phases of cancer. So cancer undergoes initiation then promotion, then metastasis or spread. So they can contribute to cancer initiation by the free iron enabling the Fenton reaction to produce hydroxyl radicals, hydroxyl radicals damaging the mitochondrial membrane, similar to the Warburg effect concept, and then the hydroxyl radicals in particular are especially damaging. Okay, the iron can contribute to cancer second phase, the promotion phase, because the cancer cells need lots of iron to grow. So it's just feeding the cancer. And you dietarily feeding yourself, if a person feeds themselves a lot of red meat, red wine, iron fortified foods, they're giving iron to a potential cancer. That's another reason why you don't want to do those things. Uh, whereas if you deprive the body of iron, you will uh, potentially slow cancer growth. And basically just think, you know, a good rule of thumb is could Adam and Eve eat this? All right, Adam and Eve probably walked around all day uh, looking for something to eat, eating plant foods later in extended family groups. And there was no, you know, omega-3 fish oil supplements. There was no uh, iron fortified food. It's not that easy to catch an animal. They're not gonna eat meat too often. Okay, cancer cells apparently use iron as part of a strategy to spread. It appears that what they're doing is they got lots of transferrin receptors on their plasma membranes to sort of vacuum up whatever uh, transfer and you know iron carrying molecules are in their vicinity and in this way they deprive the adjacent cells of iron and those adjacent cells starved of iron sort of are less able to maintain intact borders and uh, growth inhibition um, such that the cancer cells then facilitate it in its ability to grow larger and to spread and metastasize so it is thought that cancer um, is contributed to made worse by excess free iron and this actually comes from here. I'll show you the book. Um, Iron is the Most Toxic Metal by Jim Moon, PhD. And I can say all these iron biochemistry experts all will tell you iron's associated with increased risk of cancer. And literally he calls it the most toxic metal. I think it's just because iron is so common. You know, a metal like mercury is more toxic than iron, but mercury is not as common.
And then also the risk of iron, just the iron that's in your colon, it doesn't even get absorbed into your body. The excess of fortified iron in these processed food products, that's inorganic iron, meaning no carbon bound to it. That's why it's inorganic. Um, and also the heme iron in meat, they can undergo uh, reactions related to redox cycling in the colon and injure the colonocytes, especially the inorganic iron. But heme meat can cause cancer in different ways. Um, you feed lab animals excessive amounts of iron, you can increase their risk of colon cancer. So um, I think that's it. Oh, there's one more. Just so, so some references if you're interested for some of these books, for some of the papers. There's a whole bunch of other papers. I don't have time to list them all. It's not, it's not that complex a subject. It's just to be aware of it. Okay. So that's it. Hope that was helpful.